so I am really happy to um, to present our speaker today, who is Scott Gilmore. Scott was born and raised on farmland in rural high altitude Australia. He's always had an interest in the natural world, which led to a science degree and study of Southern Hemisphere bryophytes, followed by a PhD in quantitative genetics. Since moving to Canada in 2005 and Vancouver Island in 2007, Scott has been getting to know the new landscape and what lives here. As an amateur entomologist, he is distracted by just about everything, but beetles take up most of his available time. He has a passion for local biodiversity and helping people see and learn what lives right outside their back door. So thanks very much and a big warm welcome to Scott. Thank you very much, Stephanie. I'm just going to start by sharing my screen here. Okay, can you see that? It looks good. There's a little bit of the gray box, but it's not covering anything at the moment. So it's I think so, yeah, it's good. That's the gray box that's at the top. I don't know yeah. if that disappears or not, but... Um, Anyhow, it's at the top, so it shouldn't actually block anything that's important. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming along to hear my talk today. I want to start by saying that I come, uh, I'm to you from the, uh, the territory of the Nanaimo uh, speaking uh, First Nations, uh, which is, uh, I live in Lanceville, just outside uh, Nanaimo. Um, yeah, and I'm here today to talk to you about which one is it? The creation of a key to the Elatera Day of British Columbia, the Yukon and Alaska. Uh, and one of the things I really want to highlight uh, throughout this talk is that I'm actually an amateur entomologist, so all of my uh, work on beetles and other things is really just a hobby for me. But I have been uh, successful in getting a few grants, which you can get as an amateur entomologist, uh, firstly from the Coleoptera Society, the Bell Research Grant, which I got in 2021, and then the TAR Award from the Canadian uh, Entomological Society, which I also got in that year. And I'll speak a little bit more about those. And, um, and also just uh, sort of the history of amateur entomologists and how they actually have contributed to entomology in Canada over time. So how exactly did I get here? An Australian who is living on Vancouver Island and interested in the click beetles from here. Uh, so click beetles is the common name for the uh, family Elateridae. So I grew up in Australia at the red dot and, uh, and uh, I moved to Ottawa when I first came to Canada. My wife is Canadian. And then a couple of years later, we moved to Vancouver Island, which is where I am now. So at university, uh, I was really interested in, in all things to do with taxonomy. And I did an honors thesis on, uh, on bryophytes, on mosses. And then I was lucky enough to work uh, on two different occasions with the Australian Biological Resources Study, uh, helping them to edit and write for the Flora of Australia moss volumes. And the first one was published, uh, which is here on the left. And this is some of my drawings on the right-hand side. And then the second volumes, I think everything's actually now online. So it's something that you can, you can look up and you can actually find um, everything that's so far been pub published for the Flora of Australia. After I worked on mosses for a while, I thought uh, I wanted to go back to university to do a PhD, but I thought I better do something that might actually land me uh, with a job. So I did uh, a PhD on uh, the genetic mapping of plant transpiration efficiency. And I have to say that was a little bit dull. So I'm speaking about something else this evening uh, because I think beetles are actually much more exciting. So I grew up on a farm in rural Australia and I was always interested in what lived around me. Uh, and I didn't really know so much about uh, how to determine one species from the next. But when I went to university, I learned uh, from a lot of other people about birding and, and birders. And so I was interested in plants and mosses. And then I'd go out with friends and we'd go look for birds. And these are just some of the birds that, uh, that I grew up with. And it was really fun to uh, get to see and to know them. Uh, and that's a hobby that I really brought with me when I moved to Canada. Uh, in, in Ottawa, um, I'd often take my young daughter out in the middle of winter and we'd go look for owls and other things like that. Uh, but then one year I went to Point Pelee and at the wild bird store there, I saw this guide to the moths 
uh, of Northeast and North America. And I was like, wow, you can actually uh, look at moths at your light and, and, and identify them in the same way that you do uh, birds. And uh, I was like amazed by this because I couldn't believe the number of guides for birds that you could go all around the world uh, and, and look at birds and, and find guides for almost every country. And so the fact that there was a guide to moths was something that sort of got me really excited. And so I ended up ordering a copy of this book. And then with my young son, who was four at the time, uh, on the first day that I got the book, the next morning, I went out to our light at the front of our house. And I found this moth here, this white lined sphinx in April of uh, uh, 2013. And so I started to photograph moths. And then with that, uh, I discovered Bug Guide. Uh, which was a great place to actually put these photographs up. And people would help you uh, identify them. They would tell you what they were. So I put a photo up of the white line sphinx and somebody told me what it was. And it was certainly a very early uh, sort of seasonal record for that particular species. And so like I was already hooked at that point. Also on that first day, I saw this uh, Hydromena manzanita and this was a species that hadn't been photographed and put on bug guide before. So this was like really exciting for me. It's kind of like, wow, you can find stuff that uh, that there aren't actually photographs of so far or they're not on bug guide. And so you can actually be part of contributing to something in a bigger in a bigger way. And so this really took off for me. So every every morning I go out and see what moths were at the lights. Uh, like this Agira, I think it's Perlubans uh, and then Feralia Comstocki on, on the right. Uh, I know Libya's here, she'll probably correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, it, was, it was via Bug Guide and putting these particular moth photos up that I first got in touch with Libby and Rick Avis. And that was uh, fantastic because I got to learn about all sorts of new resources as well, like the Moth Photographers Group, uh, and just that there's a community of naturalists out there who are interested in insects. So of course, there's only so many moths that come to your light each night. So when you're excited about this, you can go and take photographs of them, but then what are you gonna do for the rest of the day when maybe you're still excited about this? And so I started to photograph other things as well. And this is one of the first click beetles that I came across in Canada, or not in Canada, but, but when I started to look at insects. So this was in June of 2013, and this is a Salatostoma succlii. It's quite a distinctive species because it has uh, these you know, characteristic markings on the back and nothing else looks like it. So I could take photographs of this and put it uh, online on Bug Guide, and someone could tell me exactly what it was. So it's kind of exactly like the moths. It's, it's quite amazing uh, that you can get this help. But then I would start to take photographs like these two here, and uh, they would only be identified to subfamily or tribe. And I was like, oh, OK, this is kind of interesting. These are, these are beetles that people don't know as well as some of these uh, more brightly colored or larger moths. And so I asked questions. I was like, what is it that you need to see? What photographs do I need to take in order for these species to be identified um, you know, by, these, by these experts online who are looking at these photographs? And what became clear is that it was a little more complicated than that. Because the answer I got was something like, well, I need to know if the lateral pronotal carina more, is more or less straight from the hind angle and joins the anterior margin dorsat of the prosternal margin, or if it's something different. And so I heard this and I was like, uh, what? <laughs> and so I realized that, that this is actually much, much more complicated. But I was also really intrigued because I wanted to learn more about this. And just so people know what I just read out there, basically the lateral carina, hopefully you can see my, my red laser pointer here. The lateral carina is the very edge, basically uh, hill or, or uh, on, on the side of these beetles here. And the way that you can tell the, the different genera apart is whether or not this joins this line here at the same point, or if there's actually a gap at the front, if it joins in front of it. And so that's a really important character to tell several genera apart. But when you read that in a key, it's really complicated to know what that is, particularly if you don't have a background in entomology or the characters that are specific to a particular family. And every family has its own characters and basically glossary that you slowly have to get to know. Uh, just to give a little... Um, 
uh, sort of rundown on the different parts of a click beetle. There's the head at the very front here, which is probably hidden behind this gray, the gray thing, but hopefully, oh, <laughs> I don't know how I can close this gray thing down, unfortunately. Let me see if I could just do something with that. No, I don't want to leave the meeting, so that's not going to be it. Okay, so hopefully you can see the head. If you can't, it's right at the, right at the top here. Then there's the pronotum right behind. And then there's the elytra down the back here. And the elytra are the, the outer wings or the wing covering. So most people are familiar with something like a butterfly when it comes to insects, which has these three different body parts. There's a head and there's a thorax and then there's an abdomen. And so here the head is basically the same thing. That's what the antenna come out of. And then the pronotum um, is not the same thing as a thorax because the thorax of the butterfly is where all the legs come from and where the wings come from. And you can see here the three sets of legs are coming from three sort of different places here. And the wings, which are the elytra and the wings that are underneath here, uh, are also coming out. So the, the, the thorax is actually this whole area here. And then the abdomen, which you can see more from the underside, is down the back here. Oh, hang on. It's not advancing for me. Page down. Oh, there it goes. Now it's probably going to go too far. Maybe it won't. But anyhow, when I discovered that I actually needed to know uh, more about these particular beetles and to see certain characters that were really hard to see in a photograph, or click beetles are very hard things to photograph if you want to photograph them on the underside because uh, they move around a lot, I realized that I actually needed to start an insect collection. And so I ordered some pins and some basic cardboard uh, insect boxes. And I started to make a collection like this. Uh, and I also got a microscope so that I could slowly get to know more and more about these particular uh, beetles. They're not very hard to find, and I'll go into that a little bit more later on. Now, beetles are really interesting because there's so many of them. In British Columbia, there's currently around 4,000 known species. Globally, there's just a huge amount. It's really, the estimates are, are all over the place. Now, some species like this Harmonia axidris, uh, or commonly known as the multicolored Asian lady beetle, are really variable. Sometimes they can be uh, on the left where they're red with black spots. Sometimes they're just red. Sometimes they're red with a few spots or lots of spots. Sometimes they're completely black. Sometimes they're black with four red spots. Sometimes they're black with this red C. And they're all exactly the same species. So you really need to get a note get to know the diversity uh, of the coloration of this species to know it well. There's certain characters on the pronotum here, uh, which are actually quite distinctive. There's always this very large white uh, sort of patches in the corner, even though there's some variation in the middle of the pronotum. Now, when it comes to click beetles, it's really quite different. So now I can look at these two species, uh, and I know immediately that they're both from the genus Dilopius, even though I can't see the certain characters that you need to see on the underside. But the only way to tell these two species apart is to dissect them. And so you need to do that with males and you need to dissect out what's called the edigus, which is basically the penis of the, of the beetles. So on the left here, you have uh, Dilopius insulanus, which has a central ed edigus here. And these are the paramias on the side. And then on the right, you have Dilopius tristus, which you can see looks incredibly different at this point because it's, it's much more rounded in the central edigus and even on these paramis at the side here. So this genus has a, a huge number of species and the only way to distinguish between many different species groups is with the genitalia. Uh, so the, the family Elateridae is easily recognized uh, because they have this very distinctive shape. They're kind of uh, usually quite extended and rounded at both ends and they're, um, yeah, the, the form does not change very much, but the uh, number of resources to help you identify them from beyond the family to genus or species is very, very sparse, particularly in British Columbia. Uh, so Melville Hatch wrote a series of books uh, for the beetles of the Pacific Northwest, which certainly covers uh, Vancouver Island and sort of the Vancouver area uh, quite well, but the click beetle keys in that are certainly incomplete and they're, they're challenging to use. Um, but recognition of the family is very, very simple. And you can see here that there's, there's some diversity in coloration. Um, most click beetles are, are brown, basically, very much looking like, like this, this one here, the second from the right. But sometimes they're quite colorful. So this is Salatostomus festivus. I call it the party click beetle because it is by far 
the most uh, brightly colored and patterned um, click beetle that we get here. Uh, sometimes the click beetles have very distinctive antennae. There's one species, uh, Stenicera um, candali here that has pectinate um, antennae. It's found uh, more in the boreal region. And sometimes it's more brightly colored uh, um, species uh, or that have, they have little pockets of, of bright colors like this Gambrinus, which I found uh, just north of Ladysmith. Uh, but mostly, uh, click beetles are, do an incredible amount with the color brown. So brown on brown, brown with brown, brown with a little bit of yellow, uh, but quite a lot of diversity. Globally, there are around 12,000 species of click beetle. Uh, I'm going to show you a, a video shortly where they say there's 10,000, but that's definitely an underestimate. Uh, and they vary in size from 2 millimeters up to 70 millimeters. Uh, this beetle on the left here, this click beetle, is uh, from the Philippines and it is exactly 70 millimeters long, so it is the biggest one. Uh, this is the western eyed click beetle, the second one here, and this is the biggest click beetle that we have in British Columbia, and that is 35 millimeters long. And this click beetle here is from the genus Zoracross, and it is exactly two millimeters long, and that is the smallest click beetle that we have in British Columbia. So there's quite a bit of size variation, even uh, here. Uh, and, and we're not in the tropics where there's certainly a, a greater diversity of, of all beetles. So this is a zooming in on that particular tiny uh, Zoracross click beetle. You can see that it looks very similar to the big, uh, the bigger species where you can see the head and the pronotum and the elytra. Um, it's just really small. This one lives in gravel besides running uh, rivers and, and lakes. I have yet to actually find this species myself, but uh, I've recently learned a new technique about how to look for them. So I'm kind of excited to try that this spring. Uh, so one of the most distinctive things about click beetles is the fact that they click. And I was trying to find uh, photos that would show this well, and I, I, I really don't have any. So I'm actually gonna show you a video uh, in a moment here. But on the underside of the thorax, or the pronotum here, they have this, um, this prosternal process which sticks out. And, uh, and that is part of how they do this clicking mechanism. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen and I'm going to go across to a video that shows this really, really well. So let me just open that up. And Stephanie, if you can't hear uh, hear this at all, please let me know. Yeah, looks good so far. It's good. This is a click beetle that's stuck on its back. It's kicking its legs, but can't quite get enough leverage to flip itself back over. But that's okay, it doesn't have to. It's an insect that's famous for using its body in a spectacular way to get off the ground and back on its feet. One thing I really like about the click beetle jump is you can see what they use to make it work. They have a little latch that's right here on their body so that they use to load and release the energy they use for a jump. I only recently found out about this, but when I did, it immediately went on my list of things I needed to film. But before I show you that footage, I think the best way to understand what that latch is doing is to actually look at how a mousetrap works. Mousetraps are spring-loaded devices, but just as important as a spring is this part here, the latch. This little lip keeps the energy of the spring loaded and ready to go, and when it slips, that's the point at which the stored energy of the system is released and the fast movement of the trap can happen. For a click beetle, their latch is on the underside of their body, between the front and middle legs. It's a single peg that catches on a corresponding lip and holds the front of the body in place while their spring is being loaded. There are around 10,000 different species of click beetles and they all use a version of this peg as a latch. The latch allows the beetle to load an internal spring that, when it's released, rapidly flexes the front of the body and throws the beetle into the air, with the head rocking back and forth, recoiling from the rapid movement. Here are two close-up slow motion shots that show the beetles setting the peg latch in place as they prepare for a jump. 
The click in a click beetle's name is from the snapping sound that's often produced when the peg releases and the thorax flexes. In this sequence, captured at 3200 frames per second, the rapid flex of the beetle sends it accelerating off the ground at 2150 meters per second squared, which is pulling 219 Gs. Other click beetles have been measured accelerating up off the ground at 380 Gs. It's pretty cool that the latch is so visible in these beetles. In other spring-loaded animals, ones that move a leg or a mouth part really fast, the latch can be really hard to see or even internal. It's more common to see evidence of the spring being loaded or released. Like, here are two trap jaw ants about to snap. Their head capsules are actually part of the spring, and you can see them release and pop back into form when they snap if you watch here and here. This is the closest I could get to capturing a click beetle spring. After the peg latch is locked in place, the beetle can start loading the spring. If you look here under the latch, you can see part of that process as the body deforms while the muscles in the thorax contract right before the snap is released. Of all the spring-loaded insects I've filmed, I think click beetles stand out as one of the most unusual. Without using any appendages, they throw themselves into a wild spinning high flying jump. Why they evolve such a powerful and unique jump is actually unclear. When threatened, they are quick to play dead, and when they do jump, they don't seem to be able to control the orientation of their body, and their landings are far from graceful. So I'm super happy that I got to film these beetles and see what they do in detail. I think they're pretty amazing. I should say that all the beetles that are in this video, I just grabbed from my yard. They're really common insects, so it's likely that you can go outside and find one too. Thanks for watching. Okay, that um, was such incredible footage when I found it, I realized I wanted to share that because there's no way I could describe it in the same way as they show it there. And that's by the Ant Lab. Uh, and if you want to go and search for them, they have more incredible videos as well. Oh, and now I have to get to the start of where I was up to. I just put in the chat the link on YouTube to the to that amazing video for those who are want to watch it again. So as I learned more about click beetles and uh, started to, to wonder more about them, uh, I, I decided that I really wanted to sort of contribute something. And so I wondered how can I make it easier to identify uh, this whole family, particularly in British Columbia. It, initially, I thought maybe it would just be sort of local species or species on Vancouver Island, but it, uh, it, it became clear over time that there are so many species on the island that it made sense to sort of expand out to, to initially the whole province and then it even got bigger beyond that. Um, and I did so much learning of the, 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 the language uh, that I wanted to share it in a way that was just much more, um, or much more easily understood and I thought of doing that through photographs. Uh, but, but where do you start when you want to actually sort of make a key to the click beetles? And with anything related to beetles, the, the place you need to start is the checklist of beetles for Canada and Alaska. And the second edition for that was published in 2013. And when you go there, uh, there are 201 click beetles that are listed as uh, occurring in British Columbia. And there are 34 in the Yukon and 57 in Alaska. Uh, and given that there's only 386 in Canada, you can see that the diversity uh, in particularly British Columbia is really huge. Uh, so there's certainly uh, a lot of different click beetles that you can find here. And if you would just, uh, I took a page from, from that particular uh, book, and this is just the genus Agriotes. And you can see here that uh, just the, the number of species that you find in BC compared to many of these other provinces is, is really quite high. So initially I was just going to do Vancouver Island down here, and then I was gonna do British Columbia. But it was uh, Sid Kennings uh, who, when I announced on Twitter that I'd won some funding to do this, who said, hey, what about us up here in the Yukon? And through discussion with a few people, I realized that adding the Yukon and Alaska actually only added four species to my overall list. And then it would, uh, anything that I created would be 
become more useful to a, a much larger area. So it really made sense to expand. And, and what's incredible about uh, this sort of coverage is, although most species actually occur right along the southern border here, this is where there's the most diversity, click beetles are actually found uh, quite at quite high up latitudes as well. I saw this species and I was like, whoa, they're found really high up. But then I had a little closer look at it and I was like four miles southeast of North Pole. And I was like, that just doesn't seem right. And sure enough, here is the North Pole, Alaska. Uh, so clearly it's not the real North Pole, it's just a place called North Pole. Uh, I have seen click beetles from there, that specimen, but I've also seen click beetles from up here at Old Crow that were collected by the uh, Cannings brothers. So they do get uh, really far north. So my goal is to publish a key based on uh, pictures and text that will allow anyone with a microscope to identify any click beetle uh, in BC, the Yukon or Alaska to at least genus. Uh, I'm certainly gonna make it possible to identify everything to species, but that for a certain genera will take dissection. So that's something that uh, it will be only the intrepid among us who want to go there. But it's, it's actually incredibly easy once you've had a little practice doing it. Beetles are very forgiving because they have lots of different hard parts. So it's not actually that challenging. But through the process of uh, thinking about this key, uh, I looked at the challenges that I would have. And the first is uh, so what species are here exactly? You know, how many species are there in, in this particular area? So I had the list, but it's like, is that completely accurate? Is everything there really here? And are there species that are not on the list? Uh, the other thing was access to material. I only have, at the time, I only had a very small collection of click beetles. So I really needed to get to the Royal BC Museum in Victoria, the Spencer Entomological uh, Museum, part of the BD Biodiversity Museum at UBC, and the Canadian National Insect Collection in Ottawa, as well as uh, continuing collecting to find more beetles. Uh, the other thing I knew would be important is collecting all of the literature on how to ID them. What's the history um, of these particular beetles when they were first named and how people have reviewed them over time. Uh, I knew it was going to be important to collect as much information as I could on the type specimens. Uh, I, and amazingly, a lot of these photographs are online now. I knew that it was going to be hard to find certain species to photograph because there are rare species that are not recorded very often. And then I need to find a specimen to actually photograph to include in the key. And then I wanted to include modern techniques, uh, things such as barcoding. For that, you need fresh material because a lot of the material in museums, it can be 100 plus years old and it's no longer really useful for, uh, for, for doing this genetic work. So I'm just gonna go through each of these things in a little more detail, uh, just to sort of outline the challenges that I was facing. So the first was like, how many species are there? I know that the checklist uh, listed 201 species, the Yukon added two more, Alaska added two more. Uh, there'd been a couple of publications since the 2013 checklist, which added another two species. I gave a very shortened uh, version of this talk. Um, I think it was at the Entomological Society of BC conference, and I learned about another species that have been recorded here. Going through the uh, unidentified specimens at the Royal BC Museum, I found two species that were not on the list, including the one on the left here, Megapenthes elegans. Uh, so that added two more. Early results from barcoding told me there was at least three and maybe six additional species. And then through my own collecting and people that were collecting specimens uh, and, and giving them to me, I know of at least four species in BC that currently are, are unnamed species, so they're new species. So that puts the, the list at somewhere between uh, 215 and 220 species. And I still think it's going to grow because I keep finding uh, new and interesting things as I get into the field. So one of the biggest things I needed to do was access material that other people had collected over time. And so that included uh, going to each of these uh, locations or borrowing specimens from there. And to do that, which was certainly outside my budget as an amateur, I don't have any institutional uh, support for anything like that. I was lucky enough to get the Bell Research Grant from the Coleoptera Society that funds research uh, into beetles um, on topics or, or in, in, in ways where there is no other way to get funding. So I applied for that in the very first year of 2020 and I was told I had a good application. And I didn't know if they were just being nice or not when they said that, but I applied again in the next year and I actually got it. So maybe they were telling me the truth. 
Uh, and at the same time, the Carr Award is from uh, Bert and John Carr uh, set up the, the money for that. And they themselves were uh, amateur entomologists. They were collectors and they collected from all across Canada. And their collections now at the Canadian uh, National Collection. And I, I got to see a lot of their click beetles, which was, which was really amazing. And so they're a great example of an amateur, um, amateur entomologist that have made quite a significant difference uh, yeah, to the study of insects. So just to show you what some of these collections actually look like, uh, this is the click beetle collection at the Royal BC Museum. Uh, on the left here, you can see all of the drawers. And on the right is a series of drawers of the unidentified click beetles. Uh, what I found was fairly common in a lot of these collections was it's not hard to tell what it is a click beetle and it would get put in a drawer at the very bottom here, which uh, basically housed all of the uh, identified only to family material, which is also often where the best material, you know, is, is really interesting things there. Uh, so here's uh, on the left is a whole bunch of material, the, the unidentified stuff, but even uh, when you're at the museum and you're going through the, the named and identified uh, material, like this is a box that's meant to contain just Ampetus apicatus, because no one who's worked on click beetles specifically has really been through the collections uh, in BC before, there's, there's lots of sort of errors in identification. And it's taken me a long time to sort of get to know this and to, to go through and, and clean this up. There's, the box on the right here actually only has about five specimens of Ampetus apicatus. And it has specimens from at least three other, um, well, three other species in that same genus. And I know Claudia is on the call here, and so I can let her know that don't worry, everything's actually already being fixed up from the last time I was there. So the Elatera Day are in very good shape at the RBCM now, except I still have a lot of unidentified material to go through. Uh, the next place that I managed to get to was the Spencer Entomological Museum uh, at the at the Beedi uh, collection in, at UBC. You can see the famous whale hanging on the top left there. What's interesting about this collection is that they it holds the Gordon Stace Smith insect collection, and a lot of this material was used by uh, early uh, people who studied beetles, particularly brown in the bottom left here, to name new species. So uh, these are paratypes whenever they have yellow here, and you can see in this middle, middle photo that there's a whole lot of this material. Uh, so it was really great to see this. Now, Gordon Stace Smith is actually also an amateur entomologist, and I have a little bit more to say to him uh, about him in a moment. On the right here is a collection that was made in the Yukon, and this was a, a newly recorded species for the Yukon. It's known for British Columbia. Um, there's a, a number of specimens from the Cannings brothers that are held uh, at the Spencer Entomological Museum. And so that has been, uh, I found some lots of good records there as well from, from their collecting. Now, Gordon Stace Smith, um, there was a little article in the Entomological Society of British Columbia's uh, newsletter from Melville Hatch, who did the Beatles of the Pacific Northwest. And down the bottom here, he says that the Stace Smith's collection of British Columbia beetles is probably the best extant collection from the province. And that really speaks highly to someone who meticulously collected uh, and, and has preserved that material and it's still available and is still incredibly useful. And a number of species were named from, from these particular specimens. And uh, Gordon Stay Smith also did some publishing himself. This is a short note that he wrote on uh, what is now known as Pseudosterinus uh, laricis which is an incredibly rarely collected beetle. And what he wrote in this particular article is, is all that I know about where it can be found. And I've seen no modern uh, collections of this particular beetle. So uh, if I were to go and look for it around Creston, I would certainly uh, take some of the advice that he has here. Uh, this is a little look at the click beetle uh, drawers that are actually at uh, the Spencer Museum. I think that there were 15 of them and there were around seven of them that were just jam packed full of beetles that needed to actually be identified to genus and species. So I've been there a couple of times now and, and identified everything there. So, so that's another collection in, in, um, in BC that's now in much better shape. But the same thing was true there when I was looking through the boxes of Aurea identified material uh, for this particular one, I pulled out three different uh, other species as well. The, by far the biggest collection in Canada is the Canadian National Insect Collection. And you can see on the right here that they fit uh, 30 drawers per cabinet and they have 30 cabinets of click beetles. 
Uh, you can see how many click beetles actually fit into a drawer. So it's really, uh, it's just a massive collection. They have material from all across the country and also some uh, international material as well. And what uh, is most incredible about this is that there were rarely misidentified uh, specimens in the collection because um, past workers on this particular family, Brown in the 1930s and then Becker in sort of the 50s and 60s, they actually worked uh, here in this collection. So there's really some quite incredible uh, identifications, but also some really interesting notes that you can find. So this particular species, Hypogainus rotundicollis, um, it was broken into several boxes in the collection. And then they had these little drawings uh, of, of how the Adigas was different uh, in what looked like the same species. And these are photos of the, of the uh, slides that were from the genitalia of these particular specimens. And why this was fascinating for me is that I'd already taken photographs of these particular um, species here in BC, and I'd made this particular um, a PDF just as something to help me with identifications. And I'd already discovered this difference. And uh, so it was really good to have it confirmed that, oh, this is something that's been known about. And so uh, this is it's just one of these challenging species. Uh, which particular, which one of these two is that species? Uh, and, and is the other one something different? Uh, these are all challenges that I'm still, I'm still working on. And what is also interesting is that Hypogenus rotundicollis has not actually been recorded in BC before. So there are these other two species. So it's a very complicated genus that hasn't been reviewed in a long time. And uh, it's something that I'm slowly working on because it's quite an interesting group because you only find this particular species much later in the year. The, the highest diversity for the to find click beetles is always in the springtime, but you can find them into the summer as well. Whereas this particular genus, you tend to only find it from September through to December. Uh, other interesting little bits and pieces that you can find at the National Insect Collection. Uh, there was this, uh, it says Corymbitodes angularis, which is now in the genus Stenicera. But the very, very bottom here, it, it just says not so. And I thought that this was fascinating because I'm quite familiar with Stenicera angularis and I could look at this beetle and be like, oh, it's, you're right, it's definitely not that, but what is it? And this takes me on a bit of a story. Um, earlier this year, I was collecting with people for the, from the Spencer Entomological Museum in Manning Provincial Park and I found this particular beetle here. And originally I was like, oh, this is Stenicera angularis because it has quite distinctive sort of coloration on the hind angles of the pronotum and this little sort of coloration up here as well, but you can't see it in this photo. But I was like, hang on a minute, it's a bit small and it has this black mark right down the middle of the elytra. So I found this in several places. I found it uh, at 20 Minute Lake here and at the Lightning Lake uh, day use area, which looks quite different. And I also found it uh, at Rhododendron Flats, which is actually a lot further away than those other two locations. So uh, this was very interesting to me, and uh, this beetle that was clearly not Stenicera angularis was in this box that says Leotrichus species Nea falsificus, and Leotrichus falsificus is actually an eastern species, most common in Ontario and Quebec, and there are several western examples here which were similar to this, but none of them were actually from British Columbia. And this is the beetle on the, on the right-hand side. It was collected from Lake Tahoe in uh, California. And this is the one that has the not so written on the bottom of it. And when you compare the one from Lake Tahoe to the one in Manning Park, they actually look incredibly similar here. And on the right here is, is a real Stenicera angularis, which is actually significantly bigger than the other two as well. I don't actually show that in, uh, in these particular uh, pictures. And things get even more interesting when you look at the genitalia. On the left is a genitalia of Leotrichus falsificus from Quebec. And then the middle two are this unidentified or, I, or what I believe to be an, a new species of Leotrichus, which is now known in BC as well. And then on the right is Denisera angularis, which once again, uh, even the Adigas is much bigger than, um, than in the other sort of, sort of similar species. So that's something that I want to follow up with, uh, but it's likely gonna be a species that actually needs to be uh, named as new. 
Uh, moving on to the next collection. This is the Canadian Museum of Nature. I got to spend one day there when I was in Ottawa and they don't have a whole lot of Canadian material, but I got to see some incredible click beetles from around the world. And so that's just a couple of the photos on the right. Click beetles can be really colorful and have these very strange sort of uh, markings and angles uh, if you go to the tropics. So the one on the left is from Australia and then uh, the one on the right is from Malaysia. Uh, collections don't need to be very big to be incredibly useful. The uh, Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada has a very small collection of click beetles and this is the entire collection here. And uh, I got to borrow these and, and look at them. And what's incredible is that they have two specimens that are really interesting. Uh, on, on the left is Gambrinus venablesi. And I've only seen less than five specimens of this. And they actually have one of them, which is amazing. And they also had another species of Brownia rupestris, which you don't come across uh, very often as well. So these are the museums that I haven't seen yet. So I haven't actually seen their material, but I really want to get either get to the Alaska Museum or borrow some of their material. And then there's the Pacific Forestry Center and uh, the Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada um, Agassiz. Uh, they have a, a small collection there as well, which may have some important records. So the uh, other important thing that I've been doing is actually getting out into the field. So where is it that you find click beetles and, and why would I be still collecting given that there are collections? Uh, for me, it's, it's fun. I like to be outside. It's like going birding to go and see what beetles are there. Uh, and fresh material is also really important for, um, for genetic work. Uh, so it's good to have fresh material for that, but there's also new species to be found. There's new range extensions. It's something that you actually need to be out in the field and doing, and there's still so much to cover that it's really quite incredible. Uh, I, every time I go out into the field, often with one of my kids, I find something I've never seen before, and that's also really exciting for me. So where do you find click beetles? I've avoided this up until now because I wanted you guys to kind of maybe like the beetles a little bit, but the larval stage of click beetles is known as wire worms, which you see on the right here. And any gardener who likes to grow carrots or potatoes will know that these are a bit of a pest. But there's only about five species in British Columbia that are actually a pest like this. Most of them don't have any sort of uh, bad effects on, on, on humans. They, they live in the forest and they're really helpful with decay, uh, eating logs and things like that. So uh, most beetles, most click beetles are actually really good, but this one in particular is called Agriotis lineatus. And it is absolutely the easiest to find in your garden, uh, and especially as, as, a, as a wireworm here. But a lot of species I find just uh, in the forest. This is a path up behind my house in Lanceville. And uh, on the right hand side here, you can see me with my daughter, and I have something called a beet sheet. And I'll put that under a branch, and I'll take a stick or, or my net, and I'll hit the branch, and whatever's on there will fall down onto the sheet. And then you can collect it with an aspirator there, or you can actually just see what's there. And if it's something you've already collected or stuff you're not interested in, then you can tip it back onto the forest floor and then they can uh, go about their day. Uh, now these beach sheets are really, really helpful as I discovered this summertime. Uh, this photograph is taken by Rick Avis. Uh, I was collecting with my son uh, as part of the Whistler BioBlitz this year, and it was incredibly hot in the sun. So they made a really good uh, sort of pseudo umbrella as we we're going from one place to the next. I really like collecting in sort of open fields like this. So this is on Mount Sutil on Gabriola Island, and that's my daughter uh, photographing something there. Uh, this is the only place I've ever found uh, Melanotus uh, longulus uh, on this coast was on this particular tree. Uh, other good places to collect are up in the mountains. Uh, this is, is sort of a melt pond just below Eagle Chair on Mount Washington. And my son and I collected six species from this pond in about five minutes. And one of them was an incredibly rare species that uh, and, until recently I'd only seen a couple of specimens of. So that was a really exciting find. And then there's a few other locations there and a very exhausted son of mine from, uh, from collecting in the Callahan Valley. Uh, this is another shot from Manning Park, another great place to collect click beetles. Uh, I think I got close to 30 species there across two trips this year, so there's really quite high diversity there. Now, generally, I collect them. Uh, I collect beetles from from 
the beach sheet, like actually hitting vegetation, particularly new growth in the spring. But you can also find them under rocks at high altitude, or this is a river between Pemberton and uh, Whistler. And the rocks on the side uh, of the river here, um, if, particularly if you look on the right, I was flipping these rocks thinking I might find uh, some species of, of beetle that I could add to their, to their list. I wasn't thinking click beetles in particular, but when you flip over a few rocks, this is what you find. And when you get your eye in right here on this rock, and then over on the right hand side right here on this rock is a very interesting species of click beetle. Here it is when you zoom in. Um, this is a species that only lives next to rivers and I'd never found it before and I found well I found this species and another species at the same at the same time. It's uh, Hypnoidus squalidus and uh, was, is, is this one and it was really exciting for me to find that because they're not that common in collections and I'm sure that's because not that many collectors are actually flipping stones and looking for three millimeter long beetles uh, next to fast flowing rivers. But it's something I certainly want to try and do more of. Uh, this is uh, actually collected or photographed by uh, Trevor and Chloe Van Loon uh, up in the Pemberton Meadows. And this is an unknown species of microhypnus. I actually have these specimens. They're about two millimeters long. And we have no idea what it is that they're eating, but they found these in a riverbed under stone. So that was quite an exciting find as well. Um, the next, well, one of the other challenges I had to do was to collect the literature uh, from click beetles related to the species that are found, found in British Columbia. And most of that is really quite old. Uh, certainly Brown in the 30s and Becker in the 50s wrote a few really useful pieces, uh, or actually Becker up into the 70s, I see in the bottom right hand here. But there's also the original descriptions, uh, which, which are mostly in the 1800s, and they're really important uh, pieces of information to actually know that the species as you're describing them now fit with how they were named. Um, there's modern, literature is also really relevant. So there's changes that actually keep coming out. Back in uh, 2019, Frank Etzler published parts of his PhD thesis where he took one genus, Limonius, and he actually split it up. And now there's Gambrinus and these other two species as well. And then just late last year, Blaine Matheson uh, published new genera as part of his, um, his publication on click beetles of the southeastern United States. So these genera here are actually uh, also found in British Columbia. So there were certainly some taxonomic changes that came along with that. And it's something that I've had to sort of ad adapt and actually work into what I'm doing so that I, I keep up to date with, that, with what's, uh, what's known about this family sort of across, well, across North America and also beyond. Uh, one really interesting change that hasn't actually happened yet, but it's likely to happen in the future, is that uh, Hume Douglas and, and other people have done uh, quite an in-depth uh, study using molecules of click beetles, and they've discovered that the fireflies, or the, the, the family uh, Lampridae, of which we have a few in BC, most of them don't actually light up, but they're they're not that uncommon in denser forests here, but they're actually part of sort of the greater click beetle family. So over time, it may be that they actually become part of the family, but I'm hoping that that shift is, isn't made too quickly because that would increase the number of species that I need to work on. Uh, so type specimens are really important because that is what the original description and name comes from. So whenever somebody publishes uh, a new species, they should designate a type and where that particular specimen is housed. And many institutions have actually started to take photographs of these type specimens because they're really important, but this way they become accessible to way more people. So on the left here, this is uh, Iana stridopanis, and this photograph is taken uh, at the Canadian National Insect Collection. And it's really um, amazing quality and very useful to have. But there's also um, other institutions like the Museum of Comparative Zoology at, at Harvard. They have, uh, they have managed to take all of their specimens uh, that, are, that are types and photograph them as well. So this would have been named by LeConte. So probably in 1853. And so this specimen is somehow older than that. And, and it's just really great to be able to just go online and access these because it's very challenging to get to everywhere where they have these particular uh, specimens housed. Sometimes uh, type specimens are the only known example of that particular species. 
I was really excited to go to the Canadian National Insect Collection this summer because uh, there were certain species that were on the list that I'd never seen. They weren't uh, at the RBCM in Victoria. They weren't at the Spencer Museum at UBC. I'd never collected them and I was hoping that I would find them um, in, in the collection in Ottawa. And for some of them that was true, but the Stenicera tristis just wasn't in the collection there. So I spoke with Hume Douglas who was there and together we looked into it a little bit. When you go to the original description, which is in Latin at the top, and then uh, I believe French in the bottom, we, you see it's actually collected from the Isle of Vancouver. And this was named by Candizi, and his type specimens are, are held at um, the Natural History Museum in London. And luckily Hume knew someone who was visiting there at the time, and he asked him to go and look for the type. So Robin uh, Kundrata took these photographs of the type specimen uh, and in looking at it and in, in translating the description, I knew immediately that this was actually uh, Leotrichus umbrapenis, which shows quite a bit of variation in the black on, on, on the back. Um, and so, so this species is actually going to be a synonym of, of, of this one. So that's something that I'll be publishing as part of my key as well. And it takes one species off the list. Uh, one of the really challenging things, and that was a great example, is actually finding everything that's on the list and finding a specimen so that I can take a photograph of it. So this is the only example of Ancastus anthrax that I have seen in a collection anywhere. And one of the best things about the pandemic and staying at home in uh, 2020 was that I spent a lot of time in my backyard and one day in April of 2020, this beetle flew through. And so this is the second example I know of Ancastus anthrax. And it just happens to be a male and it just happens to have also been barcoded now. So I've managed to do some genetic work on it. So yeah, that was really, it was just lucky that it, that it actually came along. It took me quite a, long, quite a while to identify it because it's quite a strange beast. But uh, when I realized what it was in the end, it was, yeah, I was very excited. Uh, some other examples of really rare click beetles. Uh, on the left, this is the only specimen that I'm, uh, I'm aware of from BC of Ancastus uh, cinerapennis. Uh, the one in the middle here is new for British Columbia, and there were two specimens at RBCM. This is Megapenthes elegans, and they're both collected from Victoria it itself, so that's quite interesting. Uh, generally, it's a species that occur occurs on the coast of California and Oregon, so this is quite a long way north. And they were both collected in the early 80s. And I certainly wonder if it's still in Victoria. And then on the right here, this is the only known specimen uh, of Denticollis denticornis. And it was collected the, at the uh, Liard River Hot Springs, I believe. So that's kind of an interesting location to find this generally Eastern species. I do wonder if there's a chance it came across uh, on a vehicle of somebody that was stopping to see this particular sort of uh, hot springs. But it is known from Alberta, so it's certainly possible that it's, it's just rarely actually crosses the border and gets into BC. So these are the two species, uh, Dilopius salatus and Neohyptonus niblii. These are the two species I have not actually seen in person. Everything else I've come across so far and managed to record it and get photographs. Uh, the top one is only known from Alaska, and I'm trying to track down the type specimen in Finland right now to get photographs of it. Uh, and the other one is actually really well uh, documented. It's a relatively new species named in about 2000. It just so happens that no museums that I've been to has a specimen of that. So uh, hopefully one day I can actually track down one to, have, to get some photographs. What's more interesting, uh, these are just some of the species that I've seen and photographed that are not on the list. So we have the new species of uh, Leotrichus on the left. This is a new species of Lemonius that is known from uh, Nanaimo down to Victoria. So an incredibly sort of well collected area, but this is an unnamed species. I know of at least two species of Microhypnus, this little one in the middle here that are both unnamed. And then the two on the right are uh, range extensions. This is uh, Ligmagus Olympus, which uh, was in the unidentified drawer at the RBCM and then the Megapenthes elegans again, which was also there. And there's more species as well that, that, that I have, um, that I've come across that are not on the list. Uh, so the last part, or the last thing that I wanted to do was to do some barcoding on these, uh, on these species, because it's something, it's a really good independent way to see if there's more diversity in a species uh, than you can see visually. 
or to understand if perhaps things that look a little bit different, if you think back to the lady beetle I showed you earlier, are actually the same thing. And I was lucky enough to, um, to work together with people for the Center for Biodiversity uh, Genomics at the University of Guelph. And I sent off three plates uh, of material, which I thought it was, there's 285 individuals and I expected there to be around 106 species. And I've actually got a couple more plates that I plan off, on sending off soon. And so barcoding is where you take one small region of the genome uh, and it's the same spot in, in each of the samples and then you uh, you amplify it. So you, you get you know something that looks like this and you, the colors is just a nice way to represent it, but it's lots of, lots of different uh, letters, A's, T's, G's and C's, that, which you can then do phylogenetic analysis on and compare them. And this is something I do a lot in, in my actual day job. So it's nice for me to do that on, in something that I'm interested in as well. And when you do this analysis, you'll find that the same species or specimens from the same species should group together and you expect there to be a gap between the one that one species and another one and that would look something like this so this is a great example of how uh, barcoding is working really well and that the species concepts also make sense because they're grouping together and there's a gap between them and, and the other ones but there are other areas uh, like this which we're going back to the genus hypnus again where there's only two known species for British Columbia on the list, but there's clearly at least three different uh, species that we can see here. And I'm fairly confident that these are the three different species. I just need to work out exactly what species name goes with what individual and if they're all named or if one of them is actually a new species. And that's actually a really slow process. Uh, another great example is uh, Hypnoidus bicolor. Uh, this is a really common click beetle. Uh, you find it a lot at high altitude under rocks. Sometimes you can turn over a rock and, and there can be 20 or 30 of them there. And it's about three millimeters long. It's quite distinctive with the way that the hairs lie on the pronotum, particularly at the front here. But in doing barcoding, most of them uh, are, all fit into the same, the same group. But there are two specimens that I collected, and these two and this one here were all collected under the same rock on Mount Washington. And this is actually quite a big gap here. So I haven't found any morphological features that distinguish them yet, but there's clearly more species uh, within this group than, uh, than was previously thought. So that's something I want to look into a little bit more as well, and I'm hoping to sequence more of this particular individual or this species from, from other locations to see if I can find more examples, and then hopefully find a morphological feature that will distinguish it. So this whole talk was actually meant to be about a key to the species uh, of click beetles for British Columbia, and right now not much has happened on that. So there's really been a lot of planning and a lot of learning for me, uh, but I can show you a little bit about what the what the key will look like or or what its purpose is. Uh, it's really important for me to make the characters like incredibly clear. And uh, if you were to read somewhere that the tarsal claws, claws were pectinate, uh, that can be quite confusing. But if you can know that they're comb-like and then actually have an example of what it is, it makes it much more much easier uh, to to go and look for that feature on, on the beetles if you have a microscope and you have a specimen in hand. So I really want to focus on really distinctive characters. Does it have this? Does it not have that? Anytime there's characters um, that are, are, are confusing uh, or, or challenging to see, I wanted to add sort of visual clues to make it more obvious. Uh, and this is a great example here of what uh, the front of the beetle's head actually looks like. And, and then there are times when uh, the features are, are less obvious, like if the third and fourth antennal segments are about the same size, like on the left here, this is one, two, three, and four, they're about the same size. But not every individual, it's going to be perfectly like that, or maybe sometimes the antennae have fallen off. And so in that situation, I'd always want to give another character. And here I've got the, the densities of the punctures on the pronotum, which are really quite different between these two species. Um, these are two species of Nitidolomonius. And they're incredibly different from one another. And the easiest way to tell them apart is actually by dissecting them. But there are features on the outside that you can use. And so I'd always want to focus on features that require less skill to, to see, because dissecting does take more time. And it is more challenging. 
um, even though these are the two species here. And you can see that the Adigas, uh, the paramias have a like a hook here and they don't have one here. So they're really quite different. This is actually a, high, a rare high altitude species that you don't find very often. This one's also high altitude, but you find it much more often. Uh, but with iNaturalists now, like so many people don't actually collect species, uh, they take photographs of them. And so I really want uh, within my species descriptions to just offer as many clues as I can about how to identify from, from photographs. Um, this isn't a great example of a photograph because of the angle, but there's, there's only three species uh, in British Columbia that are uh, like metallic green like that. And one of them is short and fat and the others are long and thin like this. And there's only one of them that actually has really extended hind angles like this. So these are the kind of clues that I'd like to put into some of the species uh, descriptions so that it's actually useful for things like iNaturalist as well. Uh, Stephanie, there's another link that I sent you uh, about this guide on the left hand side here. If you could put that in the chat. Um, yes. Wonderful. Yeah. I helped uh, write this guide uh, as part for the BC Parks iNaturalist project that's been running for a few years now. They um, wanted to put together a guide on basically how to take photographs. And so these are some of uh, some of the photos that I added to that. This is an Australian beetle, just encouraging people to take the first photo from above and then to take more angles because the more ways that you can see it, the more features that you can actually see. And another example of the one on the right here where I, the key, the traditional key like I'm writing isn't necessarily going to be useful for identifying a specimen like this one on the right, is you can't see the claws here, even though the claws that are hidden in under the leg here are pectinate, which tells you exactly what species this is, because there's only one species of click beetle in BC that has pectinate tarsal claws, so this is Melanotus longulus. Um, but I know that it's that species from the photograph because it's really elongated and it has very large uh, punctures on the pronotum. And so that's actually another distinctive feature. It's not one that I would use in the key, but it's something that I'd certainly like to mention so that people who, who look into it a little bit more will be able to identify from photographs as well. Uh, from here, because there's so many species, I really wanna break the key down into subfamilies. There's five different subfamilies in British Columbia. And the first one that I wanna work on is the Laterinae. Uh, of which there are around 62 species. Uh, and so hopefully uh, I'm going to really start working on that soon now that I've uh, visited most of the museums that I need to and, uh, and move towards publishing that. I need to get to the final museums or get specimens from there or data from there so I can include uh, distribution records. I still have lots of material to identify at the RBCM so I wanna get back there soon. Uh, there's always new places in the field I want to go. And I have a couple more plates uh, that I want to send for barcoding of species that, that I didn't have last time, uh, excuse me, that I went to, uh, to do some of this work. So I'm excited to add, uh, add some more data there so that we can actually learn more about uh, the genetics of these particular uh, species. And I have an, a huge amount of photographs to take. And that's something that for me has changed quite a bit over time from my initial uh, terrible shots with my point and shoot camera to slowly getting a better camera and then moving on to sort of uh, stacking photos from uh, a microscope. So I want to take as, as many good high resolution uh, photographs as I can to include in the key, just to make things uh, really as obvious as possible for people to see. Uh, the, this is something that's, that I have in here because it's from a previous talk, but I left it here, request for specimens. And because I'm talking to the Victoria Natural History Society, I really want to encourage people to keep an eye out for this particular click beetle. It's around a centimeter long. Uh, it was originally collected in Oak Bay in the 1980s. And if anyone sees a spotted click beetle that looks something like this, I would certainly love you to grab a, a, the specimen and put it in your freezer and contact me uh, at any point. Um, there are only two females that are known from BC. And if I could get my hands on fresh material, I'd love to do some genetic work on it. Uh, or if I could get my hands on a male, I'd love to dissect it just to confirm that it definitely is that species because this particular species in California generally has really distinctive uh, red kind of color on the hind angles of the pronotum here. And there are examples in Oregon that look more like this. So I do believe that this is the right species, but uh, of course, I would really love to confirm it with some of the, the genitalia. 
If anyone likes to take photographs and not actually collect specimens, I encourage you to do that and put them on iNaturalist because uh, I all uh, photographs of click beetles automatically go into this project for the click beetles of the Northwest. And this is something that I set up. So I see everything that comes through here. And Blaine Matheson, who is another click beetle person from uh, the Eastern North America, and I generally keep an eye on this. And so you'll usually find that most of them can get identified to at least genus and it happens relatively quickly. And if you find anything else as you're out uh, looking, I encourage you to put all sorts of photos on here. They're really good uh, records, no matter what group they are. Uh, earlier on, I mentioned Chloe and Trevor Van Loon, and I just wanted to um, highlight some of their collecting that they've done for me. They're very adventurous people, and they like to go into remote mountain locations in BC and, and collect in really interesting ways. And so they have found some incredible specimens for me that I have not found where I've actually gotten to. And so they like to collect uh, on, uh, on snowpack, because there's often beetles that will fall out of the sky onto that. Um, but they get into the most incredible locations uh, and it's been invaluable to have uh, specimens from them and other people that have collected for me as well. But you don't have to go to these incredible locations to find amazing things. You can look in your own backyard uh, as long as you keep your eyes open and you will always find the most fascinating things. So I really want to encourage everyone to just get outside, find uh, things that they're interested in and, and get to know them, ask questions, uh, put photos online. There are always people that are willing to help with IDs. That's what I found. And then over time, you can certainly become the expert as well. I have a huge number of people to thank uh, for, the, for this work. Um, mostly I wanna go down to the bottom here though and thank uh, Lick, uh, sorry, Libby and Rick Avis, Chloe and Trevor Van Loon, Thomas Barbin and Janice Arden who have been collecting specimens for me from different places in British Columbia. And each of them have turned up uh, really incredible uh, species that I haven't uh, found on my own. And they're actually quite rare in collections. Libby and Rick turned up uh, a Lathouse californicus in their backyard this year. And I've never seen a specimen from BC and there's none in any of the collections. It's actually on the list. So I don't know where the specimens are held. But it was really, uh, it was really great that they could hold on to those for me and donate them because they've been, uh, they've been really, really helpful. And of course, my kids who have spent a lot of time in the field with me, Zeke and Sable. Uh, and that is the end of my talk. So let me stop sharing my screen. I've been speaking by myself uh, <laughs> to a computer for a long time. So I'm happy to hear any questions that you may have and, uh, and I'll answer them after I can. Great, thank you so much, Scott, for such an interesting presentation. Um, I'll open it up to the floor for for questions. Feel free to put them in the chat and I can read them out or if you want to unmute or put on your camera, that'd be that'd be great. I always have lots of questions that I can fill, but I'm giving other people a chance first. <laughs> I have a question as a real neophyte in this part. Range, climate change, and will your project ever really be done? Because <laughs> how do you eliminate beetles that are no longer around in this region, like in your geography? How do you measure? At what point do you set lines around that? Or do you have a vision of how to do that? Yeah, that's a it's a really great question because there's so much that we don't know. Like there is there's a list published from the 1950s of the click beetles from Vancouver Island, and just my own collecting here, I found so many species that are not on that list. And I don't think they've moved here. I just think that people haven't collected yet, uh, or not collected in the same way that that I have. Um, basically, if there's a collection of that species anywhere, then it's made it on the list and it will stay there even if it's never gonna be found again because some of them are, seem to be quite rare. Um, and in terms of change, I think that uh, one of the new pest species in uh, the Pemberton Valley has probably moved up. Is it climate related? I don't know. Um, but if it's being found here, it'll be on the list. There's certainly, there's at least two species that were on the list that were misidentifications at the Canadian National Collection. So there's a couple of species that will come off the list. Um, but yeah, the, the line is kind of drawn there. And in terms of will my project ever be done? Uh, I don't know. 
Sorry, I didn't mean to make that up. <laughs> I mean, no, that's good... okay. I, I have no, I have no goal about when it's going to be finished because it really is just a hobby for me. So as soon as it's not fun, I put it down and then I go do something else. Thanks, Ro. Any other questions? I think somebody's unmuting there. Uh, yeah, that would be me. That's Libby. Hi, Scott. Hi, Libby. I was, Hi, just Libby. wanted to say that we're, we're both here, Rick and I, and we, that was an absolutely fantastic talk. Oh, um, thank you. No, we, we really enjoyed it. But I was wondering if there's any chance that you might put together an interim list right now, um, just the list, uh, even just for the island. Oh, um, yeah, that's, you know, it's... <laughs> It's something that I've been considering doing. I've tried to actually get my kids who are now 15 and 18 to apply for some money that I found for, for that youth can apply to for the Coleoptera Society to put together the list of click beetles for Vancouver Island. And they both awesome. said, no. <laughs> and I was, like, <laughs> I was like, you could take 400 US dollars and put it in your pocket and do this list. <laughs> they both said, no. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's something I have actually considered is 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 putting that list together because I have several records for the Yukon that are new, um, but I have I haven't done it yet. But if I do, I'll certainly send you a copy. That would that would be awesome. The other thing I I we found particularly interesting was this business of looking under rocks both mm -hmm. along the edge of, of creeks and and up in the alpine because we go up hours and a fair amount in the summer and it had never occurred to me to look for something as small as a two millimeter. Um, plate beetle under a rock but yeah so we'll give that a shot yeah yeah absolutely and one of the things i learned from hume douglas uh this summer is that if you take a, a ziploc bag to a river and you put a rock in it and you fill it with water and then you pour it over the gravel all of the beetles that are in there will slowly come to the surface ah. so it's a really good way to search for these really tiny beetles of yeah. which uh some of the smallest ones is very few in collections because of course it's such a specific habitat um, that they're really like they're hard to find and so part of going through the Spencer collection is I found uh, there was a, a specimen of Zoracross from Ontario that was new for the province so I'm actually writing that up now so there's lots of interesting material there but there's so little of these tiny specimens uh, that there's still new things to find yeah okay thanks <clears throat> where do I there's a question in the chat. Um, I think you said there were three species of metallic colored click beetles in BC. Is that correct? And then there's a second part that I'll read to you. Yes, that is correct. There are, there are three. There's the possibility that there's a fourth as a very rare species that's only found from sp sphagnum bogs in Washington. People have looked for it here, but they haven't found it yet, but it might be here. And now another part of that question, is there a species where one sex is metallic green and the other sex metallic blue? I have pictures of what I think are made in click beetles matching that description that I will email you. Yeah, I'd love to see those photos. My guess is that it's <laughs> Nitido Lemonius resplendens, uh, of which can be all sorts of colors, definitely green, blue, purple, all metallic, but they're all the same species. And if they're mating, then one's male, one's female, but there's no, um, there's no real pattern to uh, the sexes having different colors, but there's definitely diversity in in the in the coloration. They're mostly green, but there's certainly I've seen some ones with uh, with with quite a lot of blue in them as well. Okay, um, so Jenny, if you could send your pictures to to Scott, or she said that she also posted them to iNaturalist, and this was in the Columbia Valley, south of Invermere, along the okay. West Side Bicycle Trail. Um, yeah, and just some people saying thank you and some other notes there. Um, any more questions for Scott? Um, I, as a parent, I'm just very curious about how you get your kids to do all that with you. I mean, it's interesting that they didn't want to do the checklist, but um, it looks like they're good helpers and field naturalists to go along with you yeah it's definitely changed over time like my daughter used to be more interested and then it became uncool so uh she didn't do it but my son and i uh like we just love to go and, and look for stuff and as soon as he realized he could come along to to whistler uh, to the bio blitz and actually um and actually be part of that 
uh, and he got to see uh, and meet a lot of the people that had written the, the field guides that are actually right behind me here uh, and chat with them. So he's learned a lot that way, but his latest interest is, is mosses. So he's become really um, fascinated by those. Before that, it was fossils, which is still a big thing. So I can't really get them into uh, insects entirely, but uh, just to get outside with them and explore together. It's what I've loved to do since I was a kid. So to, to show it to them as well and to be part of it with them is, yeah, it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. Another question in the chat from Jenny. Can you identify male and female beetles without dissecting them? Sometimes. <laughs> uh, the, the one with the pectinate antennae, only the males have that. Um, other ones, there's slight differences in shape that you kind of get to know over time. The females tend to be bigger, um, but with something like Dilopius, uh, no. <laughs> you, you kind of start to dissect them and you're like, oh, no, sorry, um, can't, can't do that one. So yeah, different genera, you can do it. And a lot of that is just sort of practice. And there's others, it's just you have to dissect them and then you find out. But it's incredibly easy to do. Like I just take a, one of the insect pins and I put a very small hook on the end. And then uh, I usually uh, freeze my beetles is the most common way that I kill them. Um, and then as they thaw out, you can just take this hooked pin and basically go in the back, give it a twist and pull it out. And then the adegas is there and you just need to clean it up with small pins. Uh, so it's not it's not that challenging, but it did take a little while to you know to get quick at it. Um, another question we have: How I think that's a typo. How are barcodes made? Oh, okay. So some basic genetics here. Um, you take a specimen, uh, and you need to extract the DNA from it. So generally, I have a, like a beetle specimen, and I'll pull a leg off. And I just put it in a container and send it to Guelph, they do it. But what they're doing is that they actually crush up this leg and then they go through an extraction process where they get the DNA out of the cells and they get rid of all of the rest of the material. And then they have very specific, um, basically really short pieces of DNA that are called primers that stick to, to very set places. And then they make lots and lots and lots of copies of that particular region. And then they use a machine called a DNA sequencer that actually goes through and reads that particular area. And, and, and then you can do the work from it. So uh, it's called Sanger sequencing. It's been going on since the late 70s. Um, there's new technology now where you can do oh so much more, but this is uh, still a, a really helpful way to just understand some more about species diversity. Great, thank you. There's a nice comment in the chat also. Um, thanking you for your passion about the topic and clear communication. This is a useful life's work. Amateur entomologists have really helped this field. Um, one thing from that really stands out to me is um, you're an amateur entomologist, but it sounds like you are really becoming the expert in the field on this group of insects. And my question is um, all of these drawers filled with um, click beetles that haven't been identified, is that due to a lack of expertise or a lack of uh, time by the experts that are around the world? Or Yeah, um, so there there is no one that's currently an expert uh, for, for click beetles for the Pacific Northwest outside of me. There are, there are a number of people that work on click beetles, but it's primarily on the pest species and how they actually affect crops. And so it's a lot to do with pheromones um, and it's it's only these like five-ish species that are really a problem. So um, there, like there are, there is one North American expert but he spends most of his time working on stuff from South America and I've communicated with him a lot and, uh, and I work on them all the time. So I think I probably do know more than anyone else about them now. And that's just, it's just, time spent, like exposure really. Uh, but there are other people that have done work in Montana and then Blaine Matheson in the Southeast. Um, and they have been really helpful with sharing the knowledge that they have. And I'm more than happy to share the knowledge that I've accumulated too, because of course, together we, we, we get to learn more. Uh, I think the reason that there's so many unidentified click beetles uh, in collections is that they're really easy to identify to species, but there are no resources right now that are user friendly to let you go beyond that. So unless you have exposure to the family or it's one of these species that's really quite distinctive, it's it's almost like it's too hard. Um, 
And I think that's why I like them so much. It's like, I really like the challenge. Um, one other quick question about the beetle that you mentioned that was in Oak Bay, that there's just the female specimen. Is that a Gary Oak specialist or habitat? Do you know its I, ecology? I, I know, I don't, I don't know any more than that. I know that there were the two specimens that were collected in the early 1980s. Uh, it was Oak Bay and somewhere just north of there. I don't remember where it was, but um, it hasn't turned up again uh, in, in collections, but it certainly may still be there because I don't know how many people are running around collecting in Victoria. Um, yeah, I guess it certainly could be Gary Oak, but I don't even know in California if anyone's actually um, mentioned where it's been found. Yeah, a lot of that material is, is missing from the literature. Uh, generally, you know, this specimen was collected at Creston and you don't even know what habitat or anything. So for me, it's been a lot of um, trial and error in terms of how to find them. But uh, but now I find that generally uh, everywhere I go, you, I, I find click beetles. If it's the right time of year, like they're incredibly abundant and I've just gotten sort of good at, uh, yeah, at finding them. Or sometimes they get stuck in my beard, which is actually a really good thing for me. <laughs> <laughs> and and what's your day job how do you have time for this <laughs> so I, my day job i work with the uh the, the dfo so Department of fisheries and oceans uh and and it's not quite full time uh, because i've raised our kids as well so i've been the primary parent and working part-time and so that's where i've managed to get time to do this and you know whenever you have a hobby it's just you kind of want to keep doing it so and, and now as well, I've got a few contracts to identify beetles. Uh, for, and so it's starting, well, it's not paying for itself yet, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it helps. And it's fun, I get to see new stuff as well. I just finished a, a contract identifying beetles from the Yukon and I managed to add four new, uh, four new species for the Yukon that hadn't been, they, that we didn't know were there, even though these specimens were collected in the late seventies and early eighties. That's amazing. All right, everybody's got to get a big hobby now for your New Year's uh, 2023. Just, just go out <laughs> and have fun. You never know what you'll find. And yeah, start asking questions and keep looking. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Scott, for sharing your, your passion and all your expertise with us tonight. And thanks to everybody for coming and hope to see you again soon. Thanks, everyone.